about this fact, that God did destroy the world with a mighty flood long after he had made the heavens by the word of his command, and had used the waters to form earth and surround it. And God has commanded that the earth and the heavens be stored away for a great bonfire at the judgment day, when all ungodly men will perish. <laughs> good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy good Sabbath. Morning. I was going to give this message back in October, but the hurricane came through and not my power out, so I wasn't able to get my PowerPoint together. I was looking at my notes today, and it didn't print out all of my notes. If you saw me over here taking pictures of my computer, it was me trying to uh, get my notes. So if I have a, a brief pause as I'm switching from notes to notes, I uh, ask that you uh, just bear with me. I did like that we read, uh, we're going to talk about this, and then I want to open with a word of prayer. You guys read John 1 verse 5. And in the like the King James and the New King James, it says, the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Which is kind of difficult to understand what it means that the darkness didn't comprehend it. Well, in the notes in my King James Version, it says the darkness apprehended it not. But in the New Living Translation, I think it is Powerful and beautiful how it's worded here. In the New Living Translation of John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Can never extinguish it. You see, to be on the side of God is to be on the winning side. The darkness will never win. It will never extinguish the light. And so when people look at Christians and think that we are weak because we rely on God. We're relying on the ultimate source of power and kingship. Bow your heads with me as we open this morning. Father, I thank you for the Sabbath day. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your blessings and your kindness and your mercy that you've shown towards us, Lord. Thank you for your, your strength to pick us up when we fall down. Father, ask that you be with us during this worship hour. Please let all that we say and do be to glorify your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. And so like I was saying before, I've been wanting to share this with you guys for some time. And I want to say to the younger people this morning that you often hear people say that there's no evidence for the stories in the Bible. Or that they're all allegorical fairy tales just designed to teach you some lesson. But I want to warn you against being willingly ignorant as these people are. You see, the Lord leaves us enough evidence to take hold of the faith that his word is true. And I want to explore a few of these stories this morning. Now, I do want to begin by making a disclaimer. Most of the stuff that we're going to look at comes from archaeology. And you know in archaeology, you have division among archaeologists what some artifact or discovery means. And often secular archaeologists will try and explain away discoveries that give credence to the Bible, or they'll just ignore it completely. I'm not going to go in-depth into all the academic sources and material. I just want to give you a brief overview so that you know where you can go and do the research for yourself. I know before, and you guys have all heard the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? We talk about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I want to revisit this story. Because since the 1970s, a lot of intriguing evidence has been discovered that validates this story in Genesis. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 19. And we're going to start in verse 15. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 19. Starting in verse 15. Again, Genesis 19, and we're going to start in verse 15. 
And so this, this begins after Abraham and the Lord have a discussion. The Lord says he won't destroy the city if there's 50 righteous. And then it goes down. And what's the final number we end at? Five. So the Lord is willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah if there are five people in the entire city that's righteous. But we all know that there weren't even five. And so we're picking up here in verse 15, and this is the morning of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities and the plains. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please know, my lords, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there, and my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. I got some photos here of the area of the plain around the Dead Sea. And so in the Smithsonian writes on September 22nd, 2001, they think they have found Sodom and Gomorrah, but they don't call them Sodom and Gomorrah. They have different names for them. So they call it the destruction of Tel El Haman, a Bronze Age city in the Jordan Valley, by an exploding comet or meteor. And they're saying that this may have inspired the story of Sodom and Gomorrah because they're secularists. It says, at the time of the disaster, around 1650 B.C., Tel Haman was the largest of three major cities in the valley. It acted, it likely acted as the region's political center, reports uh, a reporter named Marsden for the Jerusalem uh, Post. Combined, the three cities boasted a population of over 50,000. 50,000. That's more people, or roughly the same amount of people that's in Rock Hill. And there were five righteous in the city cities of 50,000. Wow. Tel Haman's mud brick building stood up to five stories tall. Over the years, archaeologists examining the structure's ruins have found evidence of a sudden high temperature destructive event. For instance, pottery pieces that were melted on the outside but untouched on the inside. Because experts failed to find a crater at the site, they attributed the damage to an airburst created when a meteor or comet travels through the atmosphere at high speeds. It would have exploded about two and a half miles above the city in a blast, this is important, a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb used at Hiroshima. Air temperatures rapidly rose above 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. These are 
secular archaeologists that are saying the air temperature. So they're not biblical archaeologists trying to uh, say, oh, this is from Sodom and Gomorrah. These are people that don't believe the stories, but they're still saying that the air temperatures rose over 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Clothing and wood immediately burst into flames. Swords, spears, mud bricks, and pottery melted. Almost immediately, the entire city was on fire. Seconds after the blast, the shockwave ripped through the city at a speed of roughly 740 miles per hour. The city's buildings were reduced to foundations and rubble. None of the 8,000 people or animals within the city survived. Their bodies were torn apart and their bones blasted into small fragments. Corroborating the idea that an air burst caused the destruction, researchers found mel melted metals and unusual mineral fragments among the city's ruins. One of the main discoveries is shock quartz. Shot, these are sand grains containing cracks that form only under very high pressure. And so here I have a photo of some of the brimstone. And brimstone is just another word for sulfur. So these are sulfur balls that are found embedded in the walls and into the ground in the plains south of the Dead Sea. You can light them on fire, they smell like burning sulfur. You can YouTube videos of people picking them up, lighting them on fire, and this outer coating here, this white, is just the uh, sediment layer that's around the sulfur. But these sulfur balls are everywhere in the valley, the brimstone. And so it's there if you look for it and you know where to look. The archaeologists also discovered high concentrations of salt in the destruction layer possibly from the blast impact on the Dead Sea or its shores. The explosion could have distributed the salt across a wide area, possibly creating high salinity soil that prevented crops from growing and resulted in the abandonment of the cities along the lower Jordan Valley. You know, it's interesting to read the story about Lot's wife turning around and being turned into a pillar of salt. God, that's strange. Like, why a pillar of salt? It doesn't make any sense. But the Lord and his providence knew that someday we were going to smarten up and send some archaeologists out there to, to look at it. We would have the scientists with the tools to measure this and say that salt was essentially blasted across the valley. And so it's not unreasonable for Lot's wife to be turned into a pillar of salt. When there's salt coming through at 740 upwards miles per hour, and then the heat mixed in with it. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 23. And this is the Israelites talking about Sodom. Deuteronomy 29, 23. Talking about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we'll read a few passages here talking about the destruction of Sodom because it's important. <laughs> the whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. And in Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 39 we read, Therefore the wild desert beast shall dwell there with the jackals, and the ostriches shall dwell in it. It shall be inhabited no more forever, nor shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, so no one shall reside there, nor son of man dwell in it. And when we turn to the New Testament in Jude chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, we read, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance 
of eternal fire. You see, it's important that you believe the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and that it's true. Because the Bible says that those cities are an example of the destruction to come. The reward of the wicked. If you deny that these cities were judged and destroyed by God, then you are denying that there's a coming judgment and destruction of the wicked. This is a mistake that you don't want to make. You can deny that it happened, and then you can try to deny that it will happen again in the future, but that's not going to stop God's providence from working out his plans. You see, Lot's other daughters, the ones that weren't in the house with him, thought he was crazy and joking. They didn't believe that the destruction was coming. But guess what? It still came. You can believe it or not believe it. It's still coming. Just like the people before the flood didn't believe that it was going to flood. Noah's telling it's going to flood. The Lord told me it's going to flood. Oh, you're crazy. It's not going to flood. It's never even rain. Didn't stop it. Didn't stop it. And there's a passage from Patriarchs and Prophets that talks about when men had climbed to the highest pre precipice, the last piece of land above the water, and they looked out, all they saw was a boundless sea. Every which direction you looked, there was nothing but water. And then that last precipice was covered. Put yourself on that precipice and looking out, and there's nothing around you but water. Every direction, as far as you can see, and the water's continually rising. All that unbelief turns into despair. And so we know that the Bible says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to move on to our second story this morning that's also found in Genesis. This one is probably the most contested as everything in Egyptian archaeology is highly contested. Egyptian archaeologists don't really agree on anything. They don't agree on the timelines. They don't agree on the dynasties. There's missing periods in Egyptian archaeology and they don't agree on the pharaohs. There's a lot of speculation as it relates to Joseph, but most biblical scholars put Joseph during Joser's reign. There's a misconception that Joseph was in Egypt during Ramses reign, but he was in during Joser's reign. This is also the same time period as the famous Egyptian figure Imhotep. And it is slightly debated if this figure is in fact Joseph, as there are hieroglyphics depicting stories similar to the Bible as it relates to Joseph, but with an Egyptian spin. So what they've done is, is like the Egyptian figure Imhotep, they have e Egyptian hieroglyphs, and the stories pretty closely match up with what the Bible says happened to Joseph. They've just twisted it a little bit. Put the, the Egyptian twist on. The Egyptians were master storytellers. And so there's some debate if Joseph was, in fact, Imhotep. But you have to do your own research on that, and again, that is debated as well. But there have been several biblical archaeologists, including Ron Wyatt, who was a Seventh-day Adventist who lived from 1933 to 1999. And he'd done some archaeological work in Egypt and felt, found evidence for the stories in the Bible. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, and we're going to read uh, verse 39 through 49. And this is where Pharaoh uh, sets Joseph over Egypt in preparation for the famine. Genesis chapter 41, starting at verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. For my younger people, he's the hand of the king. He is the ruler. Most of the time, your kings, your, your presidents, so to speak, they're just the figureheads. It's the people directly beneath them that are doing all the governing and all the work. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And as Pharaoh called Joseph's name, Zaphnath Penai, and gave him as a wife Hassanath, the daughter of Hadi Pharaoh, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the grain brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sands of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. When you know there's some remnants of buildings and grain silos in Egypt. And so this is a discovery uh, that was made at Tel at Food and uh, Saqqara as well, and we're going to talk about that. This one uh, in particular here is Saqqara and Tel at Food. Just look at my notes here. So this, this, this thing at Saqqara here is where you would go to purchase grain. And so it's one enters a long pole of 40 columns. So you look at the picture here, you enter a long pole of 40 columns, 20 on each side. Each column is connected to the main wall by a perpendicular wall, forming small cubicles between each column. And again, this is in Saqqara. As you exit this colonnade and walk straight ahead, you come to a series of very large pits which extend deep into the earth. So if you look here, as you come up to this place where you would purchase grain, it's set up like a market. So as you walk through here, it funnels people in. So you can only get one or two people in a single file line through this area. So you can see here one or two people, and then off to the side you have these little rooms where they speculate that's where the money changers were. You go pay your money, they give you whatever you know, take it a receipt to go purchase the grain, and it keeps people from stealing it because they funnel you straight in. So you're not getting by these guys without paying. And so this is the entrance to one of the grain silos. And it says that, you know, there, the official announcement of the discovery of seven grain silos was made by the Supreme Council for Antiquities in Egypt. The silos varied from 18 to 22 feet in diameter and were probably at least 25 feet tall. They were made of mud bricks and are estimated to be over 3,500 years old. These are extremely large in size, much larger than any burial chambers. They are centrally accessible by a connecting tunnel extended well above ground level and one has a staircase extending down to the bottom. For this reason, we know that they are not built as tombs. If they were, they would have been constructed underground, and they certainly would not have been so incredibly large. And so whenever they excavated uh, these silos, it says that the design of the 11 pits is impressive. There are 11 of them with only one containing the staircase all the way to the bottom. And all the pits are connected by a tunnel that goes underneath them. And so you could essentially, you have all of these silos. They're all connected at the bottom. So it's grain. You start to take grain out the bottom. It just automatically backfills from the other silos. 
And you only have to come in from the one staircase because all of the grain silos are connected at the bottom. And so it just continually feeds until they're empty. And so it says here that there's one entrance into the pits from outside the wall enclosure of the complex. Last of all, grain was found in the floor of these pits, which has been explained by Egyptologists as having been from foods buried with deceased who were buried there. However, no evidence of burials was ever found in these pits. Now I want to talk a little bit more about a discovery that points to Joseph being a historical figure. You see on this map here, this is the Nile Delta. And there's a city there called Ramses, but the ancient name for Ramses was Avaris. The city was called Avaris before it was called Ramses. And so there is a statue that they found in Avaris, and it's called the Avaris statue, and it's part of an ancient Egyptian colossal statue believed to be of an Asiatic official of Avaris. Asiatic means somebody from the land of Canaan. So somebody from that northeast region from Egypt, which would be the area that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in. And so it says, it was found between 1986 and 1988. The remains of the monumental statue that seemed to have belonged to a non-Egyptian ruler of Avaris, dubbed as the Statue of Joseph, seemed to, have been, seemed to belong to a non-Egyptian ruler. The statue was found in a layer corresponding to the year 1700 BC. Over the statue's right shoulder, you can still see his throw stick i.e. the symbol of his rule. Carved out of limestone, the colossal statue depicts an Asiatic dignitary with a mushroom-shaped coiffer uh, hat holding the throw stick over his right shoulder. The size of the seated figure is estimated to be one and a half size, life size. On the back, remarkably, you can still see three colors on the statue. Now, what's important about Joseph? What does everybody know Joseph by? His coat of many colors. And here you have a statue, and the statue's got the coat, and it's got multiple colors, because this was <coughs> kind of symbolic for Joseph. And it says here that it's made up of at least three colors, black, red, and white. The skin was yellow, the traditional color of Canaanites in Egyptian art. It had a mushroom-shaped hairstyle, painted red, typical of that shown in Egyptian artwork for Canaanites. The statue has been intentionally smashed and defaced. According to Bytak's description, the guy that found it, the statue was found in fragmentary form within a robber's pit inside the funeral chapel preceding the small pyramidal burial tomb. The statue was smashed intentionally, suggesting that there was political turmoil in the region. It is unclear whether this tomb belonged to the, and I can't pronounce the name, which was considered a predecessor of a palace in the early 13th dynasty, or whether it belonged to this palace. You see, they found 12 tombs in the vicinity of this palace as well. So there's 12 tombs around this small pyramid, or include 11, you know, with Joseph included around. So there's 12 tombs in the vicinity of the palace, with one being the small pyramid. So you have 12 tombs, one of them is a small pyramid, which denotes that one is more prominent than the others. It says that small pyramids were usually only built for royalty or officials of high rank. In this pyramid tomb, they found no human remains. Why would there be no human remains in the pyramid? Because they took Joseph back. Because they took his bones with them when they left Egypt 400 years later. Again, as I mentioned before, there's nothing 100% definitive here, but there is, there's no inscription that says tomb of Joseph, son of Jacob. But the evidence strongly suggests that this could be Joseph's final resting place before he was removed during the Exodus. You see, the Egyptians were big on Egyptians. 
right? And so for there to be a non-Egyptian person with this kind of statue, burial, he's got the throw stick over, which means that he is a ruler of Egypt. There's only very few people historically that we know of today that could fit that. And the fact that he is depicted as a Canaanite, well, we know that Joseph came from the land of Canaan. And the Egyptians didn't discern between Hebrews and the rest of the Canaanites. They just, all those people that come from the Northeast. We're going to move on, but I want to read what Genesis says. And Joseph, this is Genesis chapter 50, verse 24. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And then in Exodus chapter 13, verse 19, we read, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. The last story I want to talk to you this morning is about the Red Sea crossing. Again, using the Bible, biblical archaeologists have found compelling evidence for the crossing of the Red Sea and where it happened at. Let's read the story from the Bible. We're not going to read much of it. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, and we're going to read verses 5 through 9. <coughs> now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this? that we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pi Hiharoth before Baal Zephon. Now it came to pass, I'm sorry, it says in, in verse 21, let's skip down to verse 21, we'll read the story and then we're going to look at the evidence. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. And he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And we know that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not as much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. You know, there's an interesting verse in Exodus chapter 14, 
in uh, verse 3, it says, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land the wilderness has shut him in. So if you look at this image that's up on the screen, the land is essentially, there's one way into that beach. So when we talk about the Egyptians pursuing Israel and Israel having no escape, if you look at a map of the area around the Red Sea for a beach that's big enough for two million people to encamp on the, on the Gulf, there's only one prospect, and that's Nuebe Beach. That's in Nuebe, Egypt. The beach at Nuebe is incredibly big and could have accommodated a multitude of individuals at the time of Moses. You see that? One way in. You see there's mountains on either side. So once you hit that beach, there's nowhere to go except into the water. And so now you see why the Israelites were fearful. There was nowhere for them to go. They were all on this beach, and they're cut off. There's nowhere for them to go. I want to talk about this for a minute. That's the view looking out from the Egyptian side across to the Saudi Arabian side. You want to know what the distance is? Ten and a half miles. That's a ten and a half mile walk. Now, you know, again, like with Bible stories, we get these images in our mind. Like a lot of times it's from like the kids' books. And you think, oh, the walls of water were like 40 feet high. You know how deep the water is right here? 2,500 feet. So the walls of water are a half a mile high on each side. You want to talk about some faith. A ten and a half mile walk with a half a mile of water on each side. Imagine when you're like mile five. Like there is no, you're fully trusting in God. Because there's no, nothing else that's going to save you. You ain't running out, you ain't running ahead, you're not running behind before those waters collapse. But what's interesting here is that it's a 5% grade down and then a 5% grade back up. So there's no drop-offs. It's just a gradual, steady decline down to the bottom, and then a gradual, steady decline back up to the top. You see the Lord's providence here? I think, you know, like when during the flood and everything's like reshaping itself out, you know, he's thinking ahead like, I'm going to leave a 5% grade here. Might need this beach one day. I think I'm going to need this beach one day. And so, you know, I, I love his providence here. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this. So, on the Egyptian side and on the Arabian side, there are two pillars that were standing here when it was discovered. And so, it was a pillar of granite that was 25 feet tall that was put there by King Solomon to mark a crossing site, and it was discovered in the water with most of the writing deteriorated by the waves and sand. Egypt then erected it in the way of it. So it had fallen over, it was in the water. And a lot of the inscriptions had been washed away. The reason they know that Solomon placed these pillars is due to the fact that they discovered an identical pillar on the other side of the Red Sea with the writing still on it, which in Hebrew had the story of the crossing. The other column was confiscated by the Saudi Arabian government and a marker was put where it once stood. And so where the pillar was standing on the Saudi Arabian side, there's now just a marker saying that this is where the pillar stood. They confiscated it. There are numerous chariot wheels plus human bones and horse bones at the crossing site. On, above on the right is a human femur bone that is covered by coral and was tested at Stockholm University. It is the right leg of a man approximately five and a half feet tall, basically mineral, mineralized by resting in the Red Sea for 3,500 years. And this is a coral formation at the crossing before it gets too deep. What does that coral formation look like? A chariot. Chariot wheels. There is evidence for the stories in the Bible if you know where to look and you just look. 
The Lord does not expect you just to believe without any evidence that what he is saying is true. Amen. I want to close this morning with John 14, verses 1 through 4. The Lord says in John 14, verses 1 through 4. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. You see, the Lord has told us that these things have happened, and because they did happen, I can trust that what he says about the future will happen as well. You see, his word is true from page to page, from cover to cover, cover to cover. The world's disbelief is no hindrance to the plans of the Lord. If this church was the only church left that still believed in the Lord and his word, and the rest of the world disbelieved and said it didn't happen, it wouldn't stop his plans from coming to fruition. <coughs> C.S. Lewis said it best when he said, A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. And so I plead with you this morning, don't let disbelief keep you out of paradise. Why should you be destroyed with the wicked and unbelievers? And I say this often and I say it again. It is Satan's rebellion against God. It does not have to be your rebellion too. It's his rebellion. He's just tricked you into going along with him. It's not your rebellion. God's asking you to repent, to come to him, to end your fight against him, and just submit to his will. It's not your rebellion. There's no need for you to perish. The Lord wants you to live. He sent his son to pay the price for the transgression of the law. Because he wants you to live. I want to close with 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But it is, as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You haven't even thought of it. Like all the cool stuff. You got, I think about all the cool things I think heaven will be like. And the Bible still says that I haven't even thought of it yet. It's better than the coolest thing I can think of. It hasn't even entered into my mind. We're going to see things and be like, I would have never thought of that. You did, that's, that's good. Thank you, Lord. I like that. <laughs> right? Things that we haven't ever even thought of. And I hope to see you all there. It would be a shame if you were to miss it, perishing in somebody else's rebellion. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you that you have given us evidence for your word. Father, it's not complete, but nothing in history is complete, Lord, as it pertains to archaeology. But you give us enough to let us know that what you said happened did happen, and what will happen that you said will happen will come to pass. Father, I ask that you soften our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh again. Lord, help us to admit when we are wrong. Help us to end our rebellion and bend the knee in service to you. Father, we thank you for all that you have done in redeeming us from our sins and protecting us from that great usurper, Satan. Father, I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please, we are going to praise.
our panel with the team number 75, The Wonder of It All. Thank you. Are you ready? 